Well, good morning, Springs Church. How's everyone doing today? Do me a favor, stand with me real quickly, and let's pray over the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God, which stands the test of time. God, we thank you, Lord, that it can be a guiding light and is a guiding light. Lord, your Word tells us that it is active. Activate it in our lives again today, Jesus. Lord, I pray for, uh, as your Holy Spirit speaks to us, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom and guidance, but above all else, Lord, give us a revelation again of your Son, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. My name's Nima. I'm the executive pastor here at the Springs Church. Thank you so much for joining us. And today, we are going to be talking about your true calling, a supernatural life. Your true calling, a supernatural life, which is the title of my message. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing today is we're going to be traversing, we're going to be navigating, we're going to be wading through what I would consider one of the most, if not the most dangerous books of the entire Bible, and that is the book of Acts. And you're probably thinking, I get it, I know why he's saying that the book of Acts is the most dangerous book in the Bible, but I think I have an idea that you might not have about why I consider it to be dangerous. But before we go there, background, contextualize. It's always good at least to get a little bit of context when we're talking about Scripture. So the book of Acts basically is this, it's the first 30 years of the Christian church. And so we can look to it, the first 30 years in the book of Acts, as a model for us, the modern day church. Secondly, since it is the inception, it's the initiation, the initial church, we can take it and use it for guiding and governing principles for the church today as it is intended to be. Third, and not the least of all, is this. The church, Christianity, is not merely man-made, but God is and was in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now to the dangerous part. Here's why I think it's dangerous. In fact, I know it's dangerous, at least to some extent, if you're anything like me. It's because Luke wrote the book. Now you're probably thinking, how does that make it dangerous, man? That's not dangerous. It is, because unlike other New Testament writers, Luke had an incredible amount of education under his belt. He was called and referred to as a doctor, a physician. That being said, when you read the book of Acts and you draw it in comparison to other New Testament books, here's the primary difference. Luke was an incredible literary genius. He used excellent prose to draw the reader in with vivid description into the moment of time, captivating his audiences. Not to say that this book is any more anointed or any more spirit-filled. It's not. I'm just telling you the difference in this writer versus the other New Testament writers is that Luke was an excellent writer. Vivid description. Drawing the reader into the moment of time not unlike who is considered one of our greatest authors of all time, Ernest Hemingway. So if you've ever read anything by Ernest Hemingway, Farewell to Arms, The Sun Also Rises, you know what he does. He uses not incredibly difficult words to understand, but vivid description. It draws you into the moment. Now, you're probably saying, I still don't get it. How does that make this book dangerous? Because if you're anything like me, and I suspect you are, it's really easy to read through this book. It's very easy to read through this book and miss the underlying theme, which is this. We live a supernatural life. Whether you realize it or not is besides the point. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. We're not going to go through a whole lot of scripture today, Acts chapter 5, but I think that God wants to speak to us here. Acts chapter 5, verse 17, and this comes on the heels of the apostles healing many. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, 
Stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin essentially is this. It's the Jewish Supreme Court, if you will, 70 to 100 members. They called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards, guards meaning and being a key word right there, guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone said, look, the men you put in jail are standing at the temple courts teaching the people. Obviously, an incredible miracle. But I tell you this, it is a lot more than a bunch of religious leaders coming to find an empty jail cell. At the very least, twofold meaning here, underlying meaning here. Twofold. One is this. It's a picture of us being set free from something that we could never free ourselves from transgressions, trespasses, sin. It's a picture of salvation. And God is showing us in this descriptive picture that it's a gift and that you can't house it. It cannot be captured. You have to freely give away what you've freely given. He will not allow this salvation message to be captured inside of a prison cell. Two, secondly, it's this, and I do believe this with all my heart. It's a picture of us, born-again believers, lingering in captivity. Lingering in a jail cell of our own making. You see, the thing is, we are free in Christ. Free indeed, no question about it. But we don't act like and live like free people. What we have done is we've put up these spiritual walls Guards, remember that picture there? Guards, we've put up guards to protect ourselves. I'm not talking about guarding your heart in the scriptural sense. I'm saying we put up guards to protect ourselves. We like these prison walls. And it's right where Satan wants us, inside the prison of our own making. When we are in prison of our own doing, we don't go out into the courts Courts like the apostles, pun somewhat intended if you understand what's going on in the American court system. Doing that's a risk. Even as believers, I believe God right here is reminding us, I have brought you out of captivity. Why are you living like a prisoner? We look at the Israelites who came out of Egypt, wandering in the desert, a freed people, hungry, thirsty, complaining. And what did they say? I want to go back to enslavement. I want to go back to slavery. It makes no sense. But that was safe because they knew it was predictable. What's going on here? We as Christians can't escape these spiritual barriers, these walls that we put up. Why is that? Why? Think about it for a second. What is it in us that puts up these guards, these spiritual barriers why do we do that? We don't trust God, if we're being honest. We don't trust God. And that's why these four walls and this beautiful building and this incredible auditorium that God has so miraculously and generously given to us, that's why these walls are so dangerous because they hem us in. They keep us inside of here. And it's safe in here, right? I mean, primarily, you and I believe the essential, basic, biblical precepts one and foremost is that the only way to heaven is through Jesus. That's safe, man. You and I aren't going to get in a whole lot of arguments about that. Nobody in here will, but God didn't intend for this gift to be kept in here. He wants us to go out of the four walls to something that is far riskier than staying inside these four walls. Many of us look, hey, look, we all think it, right? If only I could lead a supernatural life. You do lead a supernatural life. You just don't realize it. Why? Our focus is off. Our focus is off. My focus is off. Your focus is off. Do you know what the opposite of supernatural is? 
earthly. Our focus is on the temporal, on the earthly, instead of the supernatural and eternal. You see, we're praying for the walls of the upper room to shake. We say, God, shake the walls of the upper room like the apostles. Let us experience what the First Testament Christians experienced. It's the wrong prayer. We don't even have the faith to believe that the walls are going to shake. It's skipping a step. Our prayer needs to be, God, give me the faith to believe that the walls are going to shake. You're missing a step. You're going from one point to the other without stopping in between. It's like going to the royal gorge, a massive chasm in the earth, and saying, I want to get from one side to the other side without using the bridge. You're skipping a step. I promise you, it doesn't make sense, right? (laughs) Understand, it's not whether you experience the supernatural. It's whether you believe it. And what are we afraid of? Man, what are we afraid of? We're afraid of something. If we stay inside these four walls, we are afraid of something. What's outside of these four walls? The world. We're afraid of the world. We're afraid of the institutions of this world, which is precisely why Jesus came, to tear down the institutions of his day. The religious institutions, the cultural institutions, the government institutions. And what has Satan so aptly done? Built them back up. Under whose watch? Yours and mine. We're guilty. He's built them back up under our watch. Do you know what the apostles do next in this chapter? They march right back before the elders, the leaders, the religious leaders of the time. And their most famous teacher, their foremost teacher, a guy who's probably extremely articulate, well-versed, Gamaliel, you know what he says? Let them go. Let them go. If it's of God, it'll breathe and live. If it's not, it's going to diminish and die. Let them go. You know what they did before they let them go? They beat them. They flogged them. They beat the apostles. Here's the response of the apostles. Verse 41, same chapter. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing after they had been beaten, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name and day after day in the temple courts from house to house. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They had eternal perspective. How in the world do you rejoice over a physical beating if your mind is on earthly things instead of the supernatural? What do you and I do? We stay inside these four walls. What does Paul tell us in Philippians? Do nothing, do nothing with complaints or grumbling. We're grumbling at each other. And we're complaining to each other about each other. These guys were physically beaten and they rejoiced. That, my friends, is supernatural. Who's the Sanhedrin, by the way? Who do they represent in this picture? Outside. They represent the establishment. Exactly what we're afraid to confront. And let me tell you guys, it has spiritual and supernatural ramifications. I guarantee it. Acts chapter 5, same chapter, verse 1. Before we look at that, again, understand what we're coming out of at the end of chapter 4 is this, is basically everybody sold all their possessions or many people sold all their possessions, land, property, and put it at the apostles' feet, including Barnabas. And you know what? There wasn't any need among them is what Scripture tells us. Can you imagine if you or I didn't have any need? If I didn't have any needs because this church was meeting it. If you didn't have any needs because this church was meeting it. Game changer. It would change the game. It would change the game. Not just for this church or this city, but for this country and the world. Other churches would be looking to us from all over the world saying, that church has no needs. Because they have a supernatural focus. 
Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, what, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. You have not lied to men, but to God. And as I was reading through Acts over and over and over again this week, I kept getting stuck, not on that one verse, on that one sentence. You have not lied to men, but to God. I'm like, God, what are you telling me? What are you saying here? Because Peter was under the influence of the Holy Spirit there. What was God saying? What is God saying to us? He brought me, God brought me back to Psalm 51, one of my favorite psalms. And understanding all this is, is basically a weak man, David, King David, coming out of an adulterous situation, being guilty of murder. Psalm 51. One of the things that David says after committing adultery and participating in murder, do you know what David says? Against you and you alone have I sinned. That's Huge. That, my friends, is eternal perspective. Here's where it changes things. When I sin against somebody and they're offended at me, and they sin against me and I'm offended at them and it ends there, who cares, man? They're a sinner, I'm a sinner. It's not that big of a deal. We could stay angry at each other because our focus is off. If my focus was right and their focus is right, we would understand that the sin isn't primarily against our brother or sister, it's against God. That changes things. You have not lied to men but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came, and not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out as well. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the entire church and all who heard about these events. What in the world just happened? What just happened? Let me tell you something. It's a lot more than two people dying in a picture, in a story written by an excellent writer, a vivid description. It's not just a physical death that's happening here. It's a spiritual death. It's a spiritual death. It's a representation of a spiritual death that they've just experienced, that we are experiencing and seeing. What did Ananias and Sapphira do? What was the primary thing they did? They held back from God. Ouch. They held back. Secondly, who's Sapphira? Who is she? Who does she represent? Sapphira is the bride. She represents me and she represents you. What was Peter under the Holy Spirit's authority and power doing? He, I believe with all my heart, was giving her an opportunity to reconcile the situation. He brought her in and said, what's going on here? And she lied. He gave her an opportunity to reconcile the situation. He's giving you and I an opportunity to reconcile the situation. He will bring us in in love and graciousness with the people around us and hold us accountable. That's what's going on here. I'm not for one second saying that if she wouldn't have done that, if she would have told the truth, if she wouldn't have held back that Ananias rose from, would have rose from the dead. I have no idea. That's not the point of the story in my opinion. But she could have helped and we can help with the spiritual health of this church and our brothers and sisters, because God is going to bring people in our lives over and over and over again, if you are connected with a body of believers, to help you not hold back from him so you don't experience a spiritual death. 
She thought she was playing it safe. I'm telling the company line. This is what Ananias said, and this is what I'm agreeing to. I don't care. I'm telling the company line. She thought she was playing it safe. When the funny thing is, Christianity at its core is anything but safe. It's a risk. We are taking a risk for God. He never intended for this to be a safe journey. A safe journey. Yes, he's safe, but the journey necessarily isn't. It doesn't make sense. Christianity is a risk. And the problem is we are constantly trying to rationalize Christianity, this walk, and understand every last little thing about God and Christianity when you, po- you can't possibly do that. It's impossible to do that. You can't rationalize everything. That's why I love, I love when Job says, who can fathom the mysteries of of God and God in his great wisdom and mercy, some chapters later, indirectly and directly speaking to the church, says, were you there at the beginning? You weren't. When I measured from one end of the earth to the other, you can't possibly understand everything. I am preaching to myself more than anyone else. I promise you that. Because I'm a thinker, I'm a processor, I I try to rationalize things, but I promise you this. In my quiet time, when God speaks to me and he says, do this, I move. I don't care what it is. I don't have a choice because otherwise I will stay stuck in the prison walls that I've built for myself and I won't move out of them. I have to move. I don't have a choice. Not just stories in the Bible. These are not just stories in the Bible. It's a revelation of who God is and understanding and helping us understand the heart of God. We look at these miracles, these supernatural wonders with the wrong mindset. We pray that God would bring a miracle to help us, but it's not the end game. We pray for the supernatural without the understanding of why. We want God to end the pain, to bring us out of it, to bring us out of the valley. Listen to this. To bring us up out of the valley, even if it means missing precisely why we are in the valley, that God is gonna speak to us in that moment, which is scriptural. Our faith is proved genuine through trials. And when we hear God's voice in the midst of the valley, guess what happens? We now have a greater testimony for a greater purpose than just ours. Wow. That changes things. What do we see in Scripture over and over and over? Over and over and over. Joseph in the pit. David in the wilderness, Esther and her people facing termination, Paul, the apostle in prison, writing letters to us in prison, to us, ministering to us. Let me tell you something. I have been to the place that they believe that Paul was imprisoned in Rome, in the Mamertine prison. I'm not trying to be facetious, but when I look on TV and and images on the internet of jail cells, it's like the Ritz-Carlton compared to where Paul was. Calling where Paul was imprisoned a dungeon would be overdoing it. It was a hole in the ground and small, and God knows what happened in those prison walls. Trials. We're talking about trials. I love what C.S. Lewis said in the screw tape letters. I love what he said in the screw tape letters. An older book, I understand. I read through it this week. If you haven't read it, read it. It's quick. It's easy to read. It's an incredible book. Um, it's a fictionalized work of an uh, older, wily uncle of a devil named Screw Tape writing to his younger, impressionable nephew, a young tempter of a devil named Wormwood. It's a fictionalized work, no question about it. So this is God. This is the Bible speaking to us, the truth. And this is like what C.S. Lewis is doing is he's taking a fictionalized work and saying this is what Satan is saying to his followers. It's an incredible work. Here's what he says in screw tape letters. Again, screw tape writing to the younger tempter of a nephew, Wormwood. Now, it may surprise you to learn that in his efforts, his meaning God's, in God's efforts to get permanent possession of a soul, he relies on the troughs even more than the peaks. Some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. That is huge. 
Don't get bogged down in the theology whether you agree with Lewis or not. That's irrelevant. God is speaking to you and I in the troughs. Do you know what a trough is? It's the lowest point. (laughs) It's your lowest point. It's my lowest point. God is aware of your sorrows. He's aware of your hardships, your fractured relationships, your broken marriages, your wayward loved ones, your wayward friends and sons and daughters, your hardships. You can't pay the bills. He's aware of it. Don't miss the testimony in the midst of the trial. God wants you in that valley for a reason, so he can speak to you, so your faith has an opportunity to grow, so you have a testimony that goes far beyond anything you and I can comprehend in the natural, because it is what? Supernatural. God's not sadistic, man. He's not. He understands what you're going through. He sees it. It's the focus that's off for us during these times. My focus is off and your focus is off. I'm focusing on the temporal when he's saying, look to me, the supernatural, the God that transcends time, the author, the beginning, the middle, the end, the creator. I understand what you're going through. Never forget this. He knew it was coming. All he's saying is trust. Just trust. We want the walls in the upper room to shake, and we don't even trust God. We need, our, we need to start praying for the belief that the walls in the upper room are going to shake. This book shows me this is a supernatural light. I better get my focus in the right place. And my focus isn't on the here and now. Because I'm an alien of this earth, just like you. And that my true citizenship, your true citizenship, is in heaven. Now we come to the why. Signs and wonders are not for signs and wonders' sake. Signs and wonders are not for signs and wonders' sake. Signs and wonders is to tell people and show people about the new life that you and I are experiencing. It's saturated in the book of Acts. It's saturated with signs and wonders to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is this so important? Why do we need to understand the first 30 years of the church, governing and guiding principles to help us understand what's going on today, 2015, Springs Church? Why is it so important? I gave our media team a picture that they're going to put up here any moment. That is an incredible picture of a satanic sculpture being erected in this country, which was founded on biblical principles, being erected in this country in one of our primary cities. Folks, the game has changed. Not much is in your favor anymore. Certainly not the court's. Not in your favor anymore, which is why we precisely need the supernatural. When statues like that are being erected, it goes well beyond compromise. Now, we're in a situation where we can't stay inside these four walls anymore. If a satanic statue is going up in one of our cities, well beyond compromise. It's desperate times, and we need the supernatural. (laughs) We have to have the supernatural. We don't have a choice, and we have to be able to pray to believe for the supernatural to deal with a country that is now allowing satanic sculptures to be erected. We have to change the game, which is precisely what God intended for us to do, to get outside of these four walls. We say we're an Acts 2 church. We call ourselves an Acts 2 church. Big chapter, right? Pentecost, all that stuff, right? Big chapter. 
When most people think of signs and wonders, certainly when I do, we think of these scriptures right here. Verse 17, Acts chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fires and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And it ends there. Prophecy, visions, signs, wonders, blood, smoke, fire, and it ends there. And we close the book there, but it doesn't end there, man. We just do that. We just want the signs and wonders for signs and wonders sake. The last thing that is said there, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This isn't for us. It's not for us to hold on to. You have no right to hold on to it. It's not yours to hold on to. It's a new life, and you've been bought with a significant price. God help us, man. We are in a desperate time and we desperately need to understand that this book, written by an incredibly gifted writer, using vivid description to draw us into the moment, has an underlying theme that you and I live a supernatural life. Praise God for that. Stand with me. Lord, I thank you for signs and wonders. I praise God for signs and wonders. I thank God for signs and wonders. When there is a satanic statue being uh, uh, erected in this country that is going up right now in this country in one of our primary cities, God, we need the supernatural. Help us to gain a perspective. Help us to be like David and like Peter and not worry so much and not have the focus on our sin with each other and we complain and grumble, but that we sin when we sin is primarily against you. Help us to have a focus on the one true natural, supernatural, God-giving, life-giving Jesus. Once and for all, God, help us to stay firm in that, Lord, that you would draw us out to the courtyard outside of these ridiculous prison spiritual walls of our own doing to do what you intended for us to do, to to disagree and to confront the establishment, God. It's a risk, God, it is a risk. But Lord, right now in this age, in this time for us, it's only mere words that we're facing. It's, it, it, it's gonna go quickly, I believe, with all my heart, God. It's gonna change, the dynamics are gonna change, but we're not getting beaten yet for it. So why in the world, God, do we stay in these four walls? Help us to get out of the prisons of our own making once and for all so we can do what you created for us to do. Have a greater testimony for a greater purpose than just these ridiculous lives that we live. God, help me, I go first. I go first. I complain, I crumble, I, 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 I'm weak. I, I can't do it, God. I'm afraid, if I'm being honest. I don't, I don't want to do it, Jesus. Draw me back out there again, Jesus. Help me help other people understand there's only one way to life. And when satanic statues go up, it's a warning sign. It's a red flag in this country, Jesus. Help us, God. We desperately need it. We desperately need to have a supernatural focus instead of an earthly focus. Help us when we read books of the Bible like the book of Acts. It's not just a good story. These aren't just Bible stories that are telling us cool stories about miraculous things happening. These are so the game will change. Help us to be game changers and let it start in this house. And let let us, God, I pray for it. I, I don't believe it. I need the faith to believe it. But let us be a church where everybody's needs are met. Everybody's. Mine. Everybody's. God, we need it. It's a desperate time. It's a desperate time. We all raise our hands to you and say, God, we desperately need a move of the Holy Spirit again today, Jesus. We don't have a choice anymore. There's not a choice. 
People are looking for answers. They're looking for the truth, God. When satanic statues go up and we compromise and we allow them, we don't stand up for anything and we don't do anything about it, God. You're saying something. You have to be God. We're moving in the wrong direction. We're moving away from the supernatural to the earthly God. Help us, Jesus. Jesus, we stand here and we say, God, help us. We desperately need a move in our own lives, God. Start with us. Start with us as individuals and families, God. Give us the grace to pray for it. Give us the grace to pray. Let, let's stop skipping ste steps, Jesus. Help us to stop skipping steps. God, help us, give us the grace to pray for the faith to believe. We talk a big talk, man, but we sure don't do a whole lot about it. Help us, God. We desperately need your help. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God. We thank you for the blood of the precious lamb washed over us, cleansed us, set us free from our transgressions. Move us out of captivity once and for all. Help us to be a free people. Help us understand it's okay to take a risk. It's okay to take a risk when we're doing it. For the name of God, for Jesus, and for Jesus' sake. We need it. We need it, God. Minister to us. Right now, Holy Spirit, speak to all of us, God. Show us that it's okay. Show us that you're safe. Christianity may not be, but you're safe, God. Show us, Lord, that when we go through a trial, Lord, that our faith isn't so ridiculously low that all we're wanting to do is get out of it. And that's okay, God. I understand that you're there to minister. But, Lord, that you're saying something to us in the trial, that you're ministering to us. Help us get to a place where we don't get in that trial and say, God, get me out and miss precisely why we're there for you to speak to us so our faith will grow. So when a satanic sculpture goes up, we stand for something. Jesus, help us, God. Please, please help me. Thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for Springs Church, God. Lord, a church that's willing to stand up for something. I know we are. We've done it before. We've done it in the past. And we're going to do it again because we have a faith in you. We believe in you. Help us to trust you. Help us to understand this is a supernatural life that we live in, regardless. Praise God for that. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank God.